like I said, gratitude uh, to Bill Maher and the whole and the whole team there. Um, I'd also like to offer an apology. Um, why exactly did I not answer his question? <laughs> I know why you didn't answer his question. <laughs> you, you do, and you could answer this. You know, it's, we'll, we'll talk about this just a little bit. So, um, Bill asked me a few times uh, if I wouldn't be more comfortable taking the AstraZeneca vaccine than either of the mRNA vaccines. And the fact is, he knows the answer to this because we ourselves had discussed this on, I think it was episode fifty-eight, an episode that we devoted to largely to talking about the va- the different vaccines and and um, what the various risks of them were. Um, I didn't respond directly um, either either or any of the times. I'm not sure if he asked me two or three times. Um, uh, and here's why. So, you know, the fact is, yes, the answer is, yes, I would uh, prefer to take the AstraZeneca vaccine to either of the mRNA vaccines that are currently on, on the market. Um, why? Not because AstraZeneca is a traditional vaccine. It's not. But it has a more traditional, a more established uh, delivery mechanism than the mRNA vaccines do. So what that means is it's not a traditional, it's not a traditional vaccine. It does not have an attenuated um, actual virus associated with it, right? It's actually a, a DNA vaccine, and the mRNA vaccines are obviously RNA vaccines. What it has, though, is an adenovirus associated with it, which is its uh, delivery vehicle. And um, and there are a number of gene therapies that have used adenoviruses in the past. Um, there have been, it's been fewer and more recently that they've been begun to be used. Uh, in vaccines, there's a, an Ebola vaccine that's beginning to use it. Oh, we have a visit from one of our podcasts. You guys may see shortly. Um, so, the adenovirus delivery mechanism is somewhat new, but adenoviruses have been part of uh, the human uh, selective experience, our, our in evolutionary environment, for presumably millions of years. Whereas the way that the mRNA vaccines get into you and the cells is they're coated in what are called lipid nanoparticles, LNPs. And so you'll sometimes see them called mRNA-LNP vaccines. And, um, and those are brand new to the human evolutionary environment. We just, we simply have no history with them and they might work. They might be awesome. We're like, Everyone who makes any sense is praying that they are, hoping that they are, thinking these mRNA vaccines might be the future of vaccine technology because one of the things they have going for them is they are very rapid development possibilities, as we saw with these two. But um, because the LNPs, the lipid nanoparticles, are brand new to uh, human to the human evolutionary environment, uh, we just can't know yet, and so the risk seems higher. So that's why I didn't ask, answer your question directly. Bill, and I apologize for it, but yes, I prefer the AstraZeneca vaccine. All right. So this actually brings us back to the thought experiment. Great. And uh, we will link the two up here. So you recall the thought experiment is you walk into a building, there's a gun on the table, you pick it up, put it to your head, pull the trigger, and it goes click. Now, was your behavior safe? No, obviously not. That's an incredibly reckless thing to do. Were you harmed? No, you weren't harmed. So when we say that something is unsafe, we are talking, we are including the question of uncertainty about harms that may come from something. And so the question about the various vaccines comes down to harms we know about because they have shown up in the phase three trials uh, and harms that are emerging in what's Uh, referred to as phase four, which is where we are now, where Mm -hmm. a large population is being vaccinated and we're tracking uh, events that may or may not be related um, to those vaccines. Um, But what we don't know is anything about what happens three years down the road, five years down the road. There may be nothing. There may be something. And frankly, it could go either way. Um, So the point is, there's a lot to say. Knowing nothing about the long-term implications of these things, would you bet that a vaccine that is built out of a viral delivery mechanism that is similar to viruses that human beings have been dealing with uh, for probably, as you say, millions of years, um, or would you go with something where the delivery mechanism is entirely novel, we have no evolutionary history with it, and so no information about how the body deals with it? Now, it could be, and there are reasons I could make the argument why the mRNA vaccines stand a chance of being safer in the long run. 
They don't interact with the nucleus. A lot is going to come down to differences in the which... The cell nucleus. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the mRNA is delivered by these uh, lipid nanoparticles into the cytoplasm of the cell where the ribosome is then translated into spike protein, which then shows up to the immune system effectively. It gets displayed on the surface of the cells in which the uh, vaccine has entered and the immune system recognizes it as foreign, which is how vaccines work. Go on. I have one more thing to say about this. Okay. Um, so it is possible that the uh, bypassing the nucleus has some benefits. It is essentially certain that there will be um, different affinity for different cell types between the different vaccines, and that may have a lot to say about what risks do and do not exist down, uh, down the road from here. But the basic point is we are stuck in the present with no information about the long-term impacts of any of these vaccines. We have some basis to guess on the adenovirus vaccines. We have no basis to guess for the mRNA vaccines. And so given that, if you had to pick, what would you do? This is a relatively simple question. It's, Which, it's, it's basic precautionary principle, right? right? You prefer the technology or solution that's been around for longer, all else being equal. And you know, there's a ton not equal here, but insofar as we can tease away all the other variables, there are some clear ways in which the AstraZeneca vaccine has a more established history. It, its elements have a more established history in the human body. Right. And so if you think now back to this little thought experiment and the conclusion that putting a gun to your head and pulling the trigger is definitely unsafe, but not necessarily harmful, therefore safety is about risk, then the question is, well, what is the risk? Now, the harms could go the other way. For, there's so much mm -hmm. complexity Absolutely. here that there, there, it's very easy. We could put together a dozen scenarios in which the actual harm that we would know about 10 years, 20 years down the road would go the other way if it shows up at all. So the problem is it's very hard to get all of that nuance into a very tight discussion in right, the context of, of something like uh, um, the Mars show. Conversation. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess actually one more thing, as long as we're talking once again about vaccines, uh, which is not mostly where we're going to we're going to spend time today. Um, it, it occurred to me actually when we were down in LA before we went on um, real time last night, um, you know, you and I were both reading up some more on some of the literature that's out there. And, you know, what something that many people will have heard is that both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines need to be stored at extremely low temperatures. And uh, most people will not have stopped to consider why that might be in part maybe in, in entirety, at least in large part, it's because RNA is very, very susceptible to decay and that you can basically stall the decay out by keeping it in you know, at such low temperatures that it, that it can't. But not only is it susceptible to decay, um, but once it gets into the, um, the space between the cells in the body, you have ribonucleases all over, this, all over the place um, that are just waiting, primed to destroy RNA. And so this, um, the lipid nanoparticle coating the vaccine is basically a way to sneak the RNA past the inter intercellular space into the cells. And um, all, what, all, what all of that means, one of the implications, I think, and I, I don't think I've seen this anywhere else, is that if there is an error in um, in transportation, in storage, in taking too long after you've taken out of the freezer and gotten it into your arm, um, it is likely, actually, I would think, that these vaccines actually lose efficacy. And so you are going to get something close to a, a binary situation of this vaccine is either as effective as it can be, and it might even, this might mean that it's actually the, the our mRNA vaccines are actually really close to 100% effective because what you have sometimes is a failure to keep the vaccine cold enough such that the RNA is already completely degraded by the time it gets into you such that it's not effective at all. And so what you might expect with the mRNA vaccines, this is a prediction I'm making, is extremely high variance actually, that you don't have, that you will be less likely to have um, some protection within an individual. Rather, you would have like, this worked because the vaccine did what it was supposed to because it was kept at the storage, at, in the storage way that it was required to, or it wasn't, and therefore it was just getting a placebo. 
effectively. Well, so I don't see any reason to expect a binary. I, I agree with your prediction about the variance. Mm -hmm. um, but in effect, there's some threshold we're shooting for. Ideally, with a virus, you want to see cellular immunity emerge. That is to say, T cells that are responsive, in this case, to the spike protein that is being uh, encoded by the mRNAs that we're delivering to the cells. You want to see T cells that react to it. That would tend to give you a good lasting uh, immunity, which is, of course, the objective of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so there's a question about how much of how much of the mRNA has to actually survive to get into cytoplasm to be displayed to the immune system to get that response. There will be individual variation. There will be individual variation for reasons that probably have to do with variation in individual immune systems. There's mm -hmm. also going to be a certain amount of luck, which cells actually uh, get reached by this, you know, this... Uh, uh, slurry that's going to be injected into people. It's going to hit some cells and it's going to enter them and how well it is displayed to the immune system will matter. I also wonder how this interacts with um, prior exposure to COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that this spike protein is something that some immune systems will have seen and some immune systems will not have seen raises questions. So anyway, I would expect yeah. a lot of variants and um, the degradation basically, if, you know, just simple chemistry tells us that um, if the low temperatures are necessary in order to keep these molecules viable in order that they make it into the cells, that um, those that have been kept out of the freezer too long, and we've heard multiple stories now of, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, uh, some... Uh, group of vials uh, is warming up and vaccines are delivered to people so they don't go bad, but yeah. you would imagine that there would be intermediate cases and what will those look like and how will we recognize them uh, in in a data set? Yeah. Now, in this case, I would, I would not imagine um, that as they warmed up that they would become dangerous. They're just going to become um, not effective. Uh, I, I agree. Mean, First pass, yeah. I'd guess the same, yeah. but I'd love to know. Yeah. I mean, and... Uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully, what happens is they the um, stray mRNAs do just get uh, chewed up in the normal course of the um, the interstitial space being being cleared. So, um, for those of you new here, our producers are sixteen year old son Zach. Uh, Zach, can you show my screen? Do we have that capability at this point? Cool. Uh, so I just want to um, read one paragraph. This is a paper in, um, actually, this is a, a news article in the journal Nature Biotechnology, which is one of the Nature Group journals. From the end of November 2020, which was at that point a perspective imagining, looking forward and saying, what are the vaccines that are likely to be out there and how do they compare and what are the risks? This is actually a, an excellent paper and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but I just want to read um, one paragraph from it, which I've highlighted. Here we go. Still. Much about the vaccine's efficacy and safety, and here she's talking about the mRNA vaccines in particular. Still, much about the vaccine's efficacy and safety, biological details that could shape the course of the vaccine's impact on containing the pandemic, remain unknown. Quote, personally, I'm waiting for further data concerning T-cell responses and duration of the antibodies, says Stanley Plotkin, a pioneering vaccinologist and former pharmaceutical executive who now consults for vaccine manufacturers. And while acknowledging that the data reported data are, quote, very encouraging, Plotkin is reserving judgment on the mRNA vaccines until more results become available from late-stage trials of the many other experimental vaccines now moving their way through clinical development. Later in this news article, I believe it's him who says, by the end of next year, meaning at that point, by the end of 2021, we should have enough data um, to actually compare both um, you know, efficacy and safety, at least through you know a year-ish, um, of the various the various vaccine platforms uh, that people are now getting throughout the world. And, you know, he, as everyone should be, is very much looking forward to seeing what those data look like. Yeah, I think um, it's important. We've already seen some uh, changes, of course, uh, for example, um, cautions about pregnant uh, women not getting vaccines that... Uh, yeah, although on that one... Yep. Um, so... The the WHO and the CDC seem to be in disagreement. They were, and now they've both they've both gone back to the party line. They're both saying there's no reason to think that the vaccines uh, should uh, should harm pregnant women. Now, as far as I know, they haven't. Those trials don't exist. They're just sort of saying again, we don't think it's going to be harmful. I would be 
I would be very cautious if yeah. I was pregnant yeah. about getting anywhere near a very newly developed vaccine. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it, it cuts both ways. Uh, COVID is liable to be uh, consequential for pregnancy. So, mm -hmm. you know, we got to be even more careful about lockdown and, and masks and social distancing. Yeah. Yeah. So we are in a, we are in a very tough puzzle. Effectively, we are all guinea pigs in a yeah. couple of experiments running in parallel, one having to do with vaccines, the other having to do um, with this novel virus. And it is very difficult to juggle the competing hazards. And there are clearly short-term, very large hazards that come with uh, coming down with COVID. Um, and then we have to compare that to all of the unknowns over in vaccine space. And uh, it's not an enviable position we find ourselves in.